it's almost the holiday season and something that comes up a lot is what do we do with our old home movies you know you find an old home movie on on eight millimeter that grandpa shot in the 1970s how do you preserve it how do you bring it into the computer what do you use to preserve it well i've got a special project this machine is going to be built for mainly old school digital audio tape conversion but i'm going to show you how it'll work for bringing in old vhs tapes or old reel-to-reel -reel tapes or old audio analog digital you name it we can do it let's do a build <laughs> Our digital media preservation is extremely important. If you were burning CDs in the 90s and early 2000s, chances are those CDs are already unreadable. Did you use, you know, gold foil archival quality? Okay, maybe. If you really want to preserve that CD <laughs> that you burned uh, with your music mix, you're going to want to transfer that to something a little bit more permanent or play the uh, media change shuffle square dance about every five to 10 years. Now that, that was really cool. Digital audio tape. The problem is that that is degrading rapidly. Audio collection, if you've got that, it's 20 to 40 years old, it may already not be readable and you want to preserve as much information as possible. Some DAT decks actually have digital out, a Sony proprietary protocol and also SPDIF. So we're going to build a compact media ingest workstation that will be great for bringing in home movies, old audio cassettes, old recordings from the radio, whatever you need in terms of preservation. And hey, if you do have some stuff that's like old radio recordings or old TV or whatever, you know, you can upload that to archive.org. It's pretty good stuff and you should, because why not? Pretty much all this stuff came from Newegg. First off is the Ryzen 5700G. This is overkill for a media ingest system, but it's got a built-in iGPU, which is powerful enough if we're talking about transcoding 720p or 480p signals or less, depending on what kind of video we're doing. And certainly this is plenty for audio. I've got a Western Digital 10 terabyte WD Red. Ultimately, we're gonna store information on a NAS, something like a Synology. We'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the video. I've got a StarTech.com 7.1 channel audio solution. We'll talk about why this specific one in just a minute. I've got OLOY Blade DDR4 performance memory. Yeah, I know DDR5 just launched and there's some options there, but this is a low cost, no nonsense build that's also really pretty extremely powerful. For the motherboard, I've elected for the colorful B550M. I reviewed this motherboard separately. That's in another video a while ago. This motherboard will, will run all the way up to the Ryzen 5950X. Let's not oversell it. It's just a great low cost board. It's really what we're talking about here. For the case, this is the Inwin Long Beach. It's a desktop case. But it also comes with a compact 300 watt power supply. 300 watts for our plucky little 5700G, that's plenty. This is a system that can be used in a desktop configuration, horizontally like this, or vertically like that. And if you take a look at the front panel, you'll see that we have a five and a quarter inch drive bay right here. You can use those obsolete things called CD-ROMs. Actually, because this is gonna be used for media archive, including CDRs, I'm shopping around for new old stock TIAC CDRs. TIAC was the Cadillac of CD burners they were designed, well, the commercial versions were designed to be able to process 10,000 plus CDR discs. If you can find a new old stock, one of those, they're great for CD burning. They're fast, reliable, accurate, and designed for mass production. If anything can read a damaged CD, it's going to be one of those uh, TAC CDRs. The biggest drawback with this case, and the reason why I only hesitantly recommend it, is because it doesn't support full height expansion cards. So this expansion card, this is a PCI Express carrier that has two Optane discs on it. It's got a PCI Express by eight connection. This is a full height card, meaning that it's full height. It's this tall. There is a variant of this that are half height cards that are half as tall. So if we look at our, our sound card, this sound card is a half height sound card but it has a full height bracket. Not to worry. In the box, we actually have two half height brackets. Now this particular sound card has optical in and optical out, both SPDIF. And it further has this little breakout connector that has a bunch of analog connections on it. So you can really rock something special. That'll work great in this case. See what I did there in this case? 
in this case, literally in this case. Now the bad thing is pretty much no GPU exists that isn't a crappy GPU that is half height. So if we ever wanted to add a discrete GPU to the system, we're basically out of luck. First on the power supply count, this power supply is a tiny power supply, smaller than SFX, 300 watts, you know, we might be able to find a 450, forget it. It's gonna be easier to transplant these parts into a larger case than it is to struggle with the small size of this. Fortunately, cases are cheap and literally every component in here we could transplant into another $50 case. If we get our back to a wall, we'll have to get a power supply and then we can reuse all the components and we'll save the full height brackets so that we can use the full height brackets with a full height case or cases that support full height expansion cards at some point in the future. But for now, this form factor at the bottom of a stack of equipment for processing audio and bringing things in along with our CDR drive here in the front, it's gonna work out great as an archival media. Now I think if you're picking out a motherboard, definitely look for a motherboard that's got DisplayPort out. This one has DVI and HDMI, and it would be nice to have DisplayPort, but hey, HDMI will get the job done. Now Edwin has done a good job with the internal case layout on this system because I've got room for two and a half inch drives here, a single three and a half inch drive, the five and a quarter inch drive, and then motherboard stuff and all the accoutrement. My front panel connection is uh, two USB 3 ports and two USB 2 ports, headphone and microphone. There's also an optional USB-C kit that you can get and the expansion board will just slide right in here to the front. So Inwin's basically thought of everything. I also like that it's kind of toolless. We will begin by inserting our 10 terabyte mechanical hard drive. Yeah. Inwin and their brilliance look, it's done toollessly. Look, that 10 terabyte hard drive, it's not going anywhere. Inwin is a good brand. Now I know what you're thinking. He's only talking about a mechanical hard drive so far. What about storage? Well, could go with the two and a half inch SSD. That would be a good idea for a build like this, especially if that would save a few bucks. But I've got some Keoxia storage. This is a 500 gig Keoxia M.2. They're a good brand. Keoxia sells more in the commercial space and to OEMs, but they're extremely reliable. They have a really high write endurance, which makes it uh, perfect for this use case because we'll bring the media in to flash, do some munging on it, put it on the mechanical hard drive, and eventually a copy of it will make its way to the network storage. The Colorful is probably an interesting choice, but it's got a 7.1 built-in sound card solution. It's got a reasonably okay built-in nick and we've got a pretty good selection of usb ports on the back and available on the edge connectors usb 2 and 3 it's perfect for a front panel connection if i had one complaint it's the lack of a display port out on this particular b550 motherboard but hey it was inexpensive another consideration of the in-win case is the height for the cpu cooler it's not a lot not a lot there be sure to check the specs of your cpu cooler to make sure it'll be fine this is a 65 watt cpu TDP, 65 watt TDP. It's gonna use a little more power than that. The board's gonna heat up as well, but it doesn't even get warm. There's no top vent in the in-win case either. So I think going with a lower profile cooler like this, probably a good idea. If I had a second choice, it would probably be something from Scythe. One of their downdraft coolers would work really well in this setup. Definitely don't do this if you don't have a practice hand or drill with a clutch or both. The thermal paste is pre-installed. When installing a CPU cooler, you only want to turn it down two or three turns in each corner until it grabs, because the amount of torque in each corner should be identical. Save your screws and connectors. You never know when you're going to switch CPU coolers and it might be a different mounting style. Now, Colorful made some colorful choices on this motherboard, like the CPU fan header, right there, right above the primary X16 slot. We can also go ahead and install our OLOY memory. This is 32 gigs, two 16 gigs ticks, 3200 CL16. It's pretty good stuff. One of the M.2 has a heatsink, the other one doesn't. We're gonna mount it in the one with the heatsink. I'm using a double zero Phillips screwdriver. With our M.2 mounted, and our memory, and our processor, and our cooler, it's time to put it all in the case. Step one, IO shield. So with the IO shield, don't forget to bend these little things out of the way because 
there are versions of this motherboard that don't have built-in LAN or that uh, don't have the USB connector, I guess. But this helps also ground it if you can bend it so that it still touches the metal case. Perfecto. Now this case already has built-in standoffs, so we don't have to do anything to mess with the standoffs. The optional standoffs are removable, so if your micro ATX motherboard doesn't have a standoff, you can actually remove it from the two in this case that are optional. Another nice little feature of the in-win is that removable standoffs will also grab onto the motherboard when you get them in exactly the right place. So the motherboard will kind of like click down the way that it's supposed to be. Oh no, we've run into our first problem with the build. The four SATA headers are kind of blocked by the physical mounting thing for the mechanical hard drive. That's okay, we can use right angle SATA cables. So these cables come out at an angle rather than straight out, but you have to plug them in before you mount the motherboard. So I get to check these things before you actually get into it. So I've plugged the drive connector into SATA 2, as you can see here on the front. And I'm just gonna turn this thing at a right angle. I'm actually gonna route the cable kind of under the motherboard. Be careful while you do this, you do not want to scrape the bottom of the motherboard. You might cut a trace on the bottom of the motherboard. A scratches can be fatal. Now the power supply that comes with the Inwin has three modern SATA connectors on two cables and one Molex connector. So it's Modern SATA, Modern SATA, Old School Molex, and Modern SATA on two different power cables. And there we are. We've basically got the build complete. The only thing that was really a little different is the front panel audio connection is not actually going to connect to the motherboard. It's going to connect to that add-in sound card. We're going to disable the onboard audio on this motherboard. Turns out the onboard audio didn't really matter. Now pretty much the only reason we needed the other sound card is for some software and because it has an optical SPDIF input. Uh, it turns out that that standard kind of can reach back into the 1980s, especially when you have an optical to uh, coax digital converter. It's actually originally a Sony protocol, and then SPDIF sort of uh, became another variant later. The Sony protocol had problems with uh, lower bit rate. That'll have to be the subject of another video. I still have to add the TAC CD-ROM in here, but that won't be any big deal. I've pre-routed my SATA cable both power and uh, data. <laughs> but you could not plug in four SATA devices into this motherboard if you tried. So it's a good thing that I opted for the M.2 for primary storage because I couldn't have physically fit a SATA SSD in here because of the right angle connectors with this particular motherboard. Now another option you might be tempted by is to use a USB audio DAC or something like that. That absolutely can work, and USB audio DACs are great, but for archival and digitization and things like that, I don't 100% trust USB, especially over, you know, it's like I've got eight hours of audio tape here, I'm just gonna let it record and come back to it. Will everything actually be working correctly? I don't trust USB for that, I just, just don't. Now in terms of software, I, yeah, Windows 11, but it's gonna be easy for the archivists to use. Linux has a lot of great utilities for archiving, but ultimately other people are gonna be doing the actual archiving. So hey, Windows 11 it is. There's different software that I plan to use. And I do actually probably plan to use a USB video capture. Something like a Dazzle, you know, the USB Dazzle, it's composite input. Get those on eBay for like 10 bucks. That's great for capturing VHS video from old camcorders or VCRs or whatever. For the software part of this, and what we're gonna get into with uh, digital audio tapes and some of the other stuff, that's gonna have to be in a follow-up video, or more likely a post on the Level 1 forum with some photos and video. Be sure to check that out. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out, and you can find me at the Level 1 forums.